Good evening and welcome to our Sunday evening Bible study. And uh, this evening we will do what we typically done, do what we have typically done, and that is to spend a little time reviewing the message this morning. And I'll take some questions or comments that you might have, and then I'm going to turn it over to Brother Earl, who will actually lead our Bible study tonight. So in, in light of that, I'm going to start with just talking about uh, this this morning we were on the sixth commandment, which is do not murder, Exodus 20, 13. And um, I spent the first part talking about different phrases that talk about the law and started with Jesus's two great commandments and then moved on to the 10 commandments and then recognized there are 613 other laws and said that those all equal the same thing, that, that those phrases speak to the law and morality of the Old Testament as given in Moses' law. Jesus summarizes with his two commandments and says that the law and the prophets uh, all, all hang on those. And then uh, often the Ten Commandments are used to talk about the whole law. And then there's the 613. All of those are based on God's righteousness. That God, when he reveals himself, he reveals who he is. He gives his values, and then he has a legal, uh, uh, a legal code that reflects those values. And that, that legal code was the Mosaic Covenant. And there were, uh, there were some graphics that helped see that. I hope they helped see that. But uh, we, I just wanted to spend some time in talking about the law. And, and quite frankly, I'm going to do that a couple more times and talk about the law in general before I actually get into the sermon itself. Um, I, I told Pam that I have two sermons, but um, that's not exactly the, the truth. Um, and so then we got into the issues of, of the, the, um, the commandment itself, but I wanted, to, I wanted to show that the commandment only uh, codified what everybody already knew, that God had given life in Genesis 1, Genesis 2, that, that death came through sin, and that God had both used death how he wanted, as well as fought against death in Jesus Christ. And Christ himself had victory over death. He offers life to his people. And then that there's, there's eventually going to be a defeat of death, according to Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15. And, and so God remains the Lord over life and death. And I think that's key for this passage uh, to recognize that God is the one who gives life. God is the one who who, who takes life, and that there are areas in which he has given us some responsibility, but for the most part, it's his. And when we try to take too much of that, we're impinging on his glory. And so uh, in light of that, we went into the wording of the commandment itself, and, and I don't think, uh, I spent a lot of time saying, I don't think that the word, uh, it says don't kill, I think that's the word kill says too much. And then you say, well, then say don't murder. Well, if you say too, don't murder, you say too little. And so we don't have this in-between word in English that really covers what, what this Hebrew word means. And I went on to say that it doesn't mean just don't kill a human because there's other situations in which you don't have moral guilt if a, if a human is killed. For example, when there's capital punishment in an act of war or in self-protection of you and, and your household. Those are all areas of self-defense. Those are all areas in which a person can uh, kill someone and not have moral guilt upon them. Uh, the, the other laws, the other 613 laws go into more specific details in each of those situations. So it's, it's not quite as clear. Um, the other, the other thing I want to spend time on is the idea of suicide and, and that is considered self-murder from, from the standpoint of this commandment and is understood uh, as for Christians as being a sin. However, it is not the sin without uh, which there is, it's not the sin that has no forgiveness. And um, we talked a little bit about the need to repent from your sins, but because you haven't repented from every sin does not mean you will not go to heaven. And I tried to make it clear that, that um, God's forgiveness is not based on our repentance, and uh, our salvation is not based on our ability to confess. 
and that we will all die with unrepentant sin on our record. Um, and, and having established that, uh, I went into different situations in which um, somebody else other than me has called America having a culture of death. And some of the situations that we face today that, that um, earn that title for us. And I mentioned abortion, infanticide, youth in Asia, and assisted suicide and went into some detail on each of those, but not great detail on any one of those, but just showed how we've gotten used to and even had legal, uh, have been given legal permission in some of these cases to actually exercise this. And uh, there, are, there are a few things that I, I, I uh, when, when particularly talking about um, assisted suicide, you know, I would argue that that really quickly ends up being murder in the end in all the cultures that have accepted it. And um, then I went into uh, looking at Jesus's comments on, on the sixth commandment and pointed out that he gets beyond the actions and down into our, our, our state of mind, our motivations, our attitudes, our desires, and finds the sin there. And, and what's amazing is he equates the sin in the heart to the actual deed and, and um, starts talking about murder within, our, within us, that we have, we have thought the murder and desired the murder, even if we haven't committed the murder. And then James 4, 1 and 2 says that uh, if, if we have these conflicts with other people, that proves that there's something wrong with our heart, we're waging war, and uh, the lusts or desires within us make us commit murder against the person we're dealing with. And so our conflicts with other people are witnesses against us that we do have murder in our heart. And um, thankfully we also have Christ though, who he himself was not a murderer and the exactly opposite. He is forgiving when he is murdered and that he not only does not murder and take like himself, he actually gives life and gives us uh, the ability in Christ to love our enemies as well as the instruction to go ahead and do so. And the, the picture of uh, how we're to do this, or, or one of the pictures in scripture, is the Good Samaritan, um, Jesus' most liberal definition of what a, a neighbor could be, and then how we are to take care of other people's um, uh, use our resources for other people's goods, and um, basically ended there. So uh, that was this morning, and I will entertain any kind of questions or comments. All right, in the back. Yeah. Uh, oh, so you. <laughs> yeah. So uh, basically, I had a two-part question. Okay. What about? If someone is, let's say, maliciously torturing and killing animals, and this is just something they like to do for non-useful purpose, just to do it. And the second part is, what about a glutton that is just repeatedly slaughtering animals to eat for the sake of gluttony? Um, both of those would, would be sins, but I don't think uh, because they're not dealing with, with killing people that this offends the Sixth Commandment. Um, the word used in the Sixth Commandment always has a person as a direct object when it has a direct object. In the Sixth Commandment, there is no direct object. It, just, uh, it doesn't tell you who you're not to kill or what you're not to kill. But the actual word murder or kill there well, it's hard to find an English equivalent, as I said, it always refers to a person. And so it's not talking about hunting, it's not talking about you know, killing weeds by pulling them out of your garden or something like that. It, that's not the kind of killing it's talking about, it's talking about people. So uh, say you're a sadistic person who kills animals uh, just to kill animals, that's, that's certainly a sin, there's something wrong in that heart, there's something wrong with that deed, but I wouldn't call it an offense of the Sixth Commandment nor would I, the one who kills for, for eating purposes or even gluttony purposes. Those are breaking, I mean, gluttony is a sin in and of itself, but it's not breaking the Sixth Commandment. Any other, yes, Earl? Have you heard any arguments for those uh, that would say that um, you've learned 
going to go to hell if you self-murder because you don't have uh, the chance to repent. Have you heard the arguments against your statement where you said everybody is going to die with unrepentance? I... Um, it's funny, I was talking to Pastor Skepp about this today, and somebody asked him a question a couple weeks ago along those lines. And I have heard it and read it, but I, I, didn't, I don't have a feeling of how popular an argument that is. I do know it's a, uh, the Roman Catholics uh, believe that that sin is, is unforgivable because of the, the inability to repent, um, if I understand their doctrine correctly. I know, I know they teach that or have taught that. Um, or at least the Catholics that I run into on the street, that's what they thought they heard. Because uh, the official church doctrine is sometimes different than, than what gets to the average Catholic. But um, I do think the Roman Catholics have a history of interpreting it that way. Yeah. Upstairs. Yeah, I guess I had a follow-up to the earlier questions. So... When Nathan talked to David about the story of the lamb that was taken from the man who loved the lamb like his own, I guess, almost child, and David said that that man should be put to death, should we take David's response as, uh, I guess, his own emotion? or? Yeah, I think David was having a visceral response to that, but I don't think it's his response was in real in response to what was happening to the lamb. I think it has to do with this person who had everything, took something from somebody else, and, and uh, used that rather than all the sheep he had. And, and I think that's Nathan's point exactly, is that God had blessed David in so many ways, and David took something that was not his. And, and so I don't think the point was whether that was a lamb and whether the Sixth Commandment was broken or not. And if David was thinking in those terms, uh, he was probably just speaking emotionally. He was, he was not right. I think he was responding, though, to the injustice in general of taking uh, somebody's poor pet <laughs> and instead of all the other uh, resources that person already had. Yes, Has God ever, in other words, in the passages where God kills people, is that word used? I'd have to look that up. I'm not sure. I can guarantee you whether God is the one acting or not, when that word is used, it was a person who died. Not an animal, not a plant. But I don't know if God's ever, I'd have to relook at that. And in, in that passage from Deuteronomy 32, 39, where it says, I kill and I make alive. Is that, is that, um, is that describing God's sovereignty? Because are we saying that God is killing everybody? No, I think that's not what it's saying there. He's not saying that he kills everybody, but it's saying that he is the Lord over that process. He is the Lord that gives light. He is the Lord who, who takes life. And uh, he's not conceding that point. That's his responsibility and his authority. And, and the, you know, I think, that's, I think that's the big part of what's happening in the Sixth Commandment is that, is that if you start with the fact that God's in charge of giving life and, and, and taking life, that's his domain, and he's, he's carved that out for himself. And then he says, within that, I'm giving man some responsibility for example, when a murder has taken place, you are to execute the murderer as a, as a, as a culture, not in a revenge way, but, but society's authoritative leadership needs to do that. And so he carves out a piece of his authority and gives us responsibility in that area or stewardship in that area. But what we've done is we've carved out other areas that I would say are illegitimate, like uh, euthanasia, like assisted suicide, like suicide, like um, abortion. All of these are areas in which we've gone in and taken and taking God's taking what's God's authority and decided we're going to be Lord over this when when He's not given us that. You know, 
the days of a person are in God's hands. And I'm not saying that we, we trump his sovereignty. What I'm saying is we have, we, we are, have bad stewardship over the life and death that he's given us. And then we go in and we exert our lordship over what, what he is God over in these other areas. That God's killing in that verse, he only kills for justice sake, that he doesn't kill randomly like we do. I, I wouldn't say, I don't know why God kills. I, I, so we can't put that, I just, we can't let me put read our the, ideas about that on God. Right. Because we don't. Let me just read what it says. It says, see now that I, I am he, and there is no God beside me. Okay, this is, this is me alone, God. It is I who put to death and give life. I have wounded, and it's I who heal, and there is no one who can deliver from my hand. And so he's just establishing his authority and sovereignty over that in a way that you should hear that. You know, we ought to understand that life and death is in the hands of the Lord. And yet there are some small areas, like capital punishment, that he has given us responsibility and stewardship over. So somebody logically could just say, well, it, um, God is killing all of these babies. And God is these um, uh, murders that are happening. He's, yeah, well, yes, you could, you could say everything that happens happens according to the will of God. And then whether that's good or bad, and not just near killing, anything that happens, has happened, is, is by the will of God, because nothing happens. If you, if you understand sovereignty of God the way we try to uh, define it and preach it here, um, the will of God, all history is the will of God. Well, some of history is some bad history, right? Um, on, the, on the large scale as well as the individual uh, person's uh, history, some of it's bad. Well, God, we would say, allowed that to happen in his sovereignty. That was, that was part of his providence. And we don't like it because it hurt us, but that was the will of God. Now, having said that, why does God do what he does? We don't know on any of that. I mean, he doesn't tell us why he does the things he does. He doesn't tell us why somebody lives to be 110 and another person dies at 16. He, he just doesn't. And, and yet that's his prerogative to run the world the way he wants to run the world. That's not to say there isn't a reason. It's to say he doesn't tell us the reasons. And I think, I think it's statements like this in Deuteronomy 32 you know, where he establishes that. I mean, if you ask me what, what, what's a verse that describes the providence, the providence and the sovereignty of God, I would say, yeah, Deuteronomy 36, 39 is one area in which he definitely declares his sovereignty. Any other thoughts or questions? Yeah, go ahead. You want to follow that up? Uh, this is on a different track. Um, you were mentioning about how the culture is just filled with so much violence today, both in shows and movies and just songs and everything. And um, I just, at, at what point, at what point for a Christian, I mean, I guess everybody has their own conscience about what bothers them, but at, at what point do you have to say, none of that is healthy for you, and yet, you know, I mean, we've had these discussions with, um, especially our boys that wanted to do those, you know, army games and stuff, and right. learn about stuff, and I think, well, that's a good thing. I, I, if, you know, if they chose to be in the army, I would like for them to be good be able to shoot a gun and be able to shoot somebody because they need to be able to do that. So how do you? You know that's not learned on video games, though, right? What's that? You're not. Those. Are, that's not learned on video games. <laughs> What's that? Shooting guns is not learned on video games. No, I know that. Yeah. <laughs> but so so how do you how do you balance all that stuff and yet yeah. um, even for your own self that you know you don't come down legalistic and say right. you should never watch this show because right. it's just awful right. and yet for the other extreme you know basically you, there's nothing there, what, what do you want there's nothing entertaining right. today <laughs> I, uh, I think I think you have to uh, 
I think you have to be discerning and know yourself and know who you're responsible for and what you're putting in front of them in your own eyes and what that does to you. And, and to be honest about it and say, you know, what, what is wrong, what is right, what is too much, all these kinds of questions that are really judgment type questions. Um, are there certain things that you should never see or do? Yes, certainly. Um, where in the vast realm of entertainment is that line drawn? You can't you can say some things are definitely out of bounds, but, but also of all the things that are not definitely out of bounds, there's probably some things that because you are who you are, uh, your children are who they are, they need to be put out of bounds in your own house. And, and I think that takes judgment and, and consciousness, uh, conscientiousness. And um, I would, you know, I would go back to Philippians 4, 8. If, if you're always, if, if whenever you have free time or optional, you know, time, you're always going back to scenes of sex and murder and violence, you know, you're not, you're not doing what Philippians 4.8 says. And, and one, of, one of the good things about this is it's a positive to put these things in front of you. It's not so much take these other things away, but, but positively use your choices to put these things in front of you. And by positively putting the right choices in front of you, the other side of the coin is you're, you're pushing away things that shouldn't be in front of you. And so I would just say that needs to be a conscientious effort and an understanding that I would be hesitant to prescribe uh, in a very detailed way a lot of that for another person. I, I wouldn't have, you know, there's some things that I think you ought not have in front of your eyes. But once we've excluded that, I, I, don't, I feel uncomfortable drawing lines for somebody else. But I do think you need to draw your own lines. Shanice? I've never heard that the idea that America has a culture of death, but I've heard that we um, and agree that we don't value life. Do you see those as the same thing, similar things, or the culture of death has led to our devaluing of life? I, I think I think that things work hand in hand, but I do think that on the extreme there are groups of people who who want to get rid of certain kinds of life and are trying to stomp it down. And then I think there are some people who have just been desensitized to life and death issues. And, and they don't think of it in moral terms, they think of it in legal terms. That, you know, if the law says I can do it, I can do it. Well, the law is not always moral. <laughs> and so um, some of these issues that I mentioned this morning, you know, uh, I, I read, uh, uh, I read something that said, you know, now that we've had the Supreme Court decision of Dobbs last year, more Americans are against abortion than before that. Well, to me, that doesn't make sense in one sense. You know, just because the Supreme Court says yes or no doesn't make it a moral or immoral issue. Um, either they can recognize morality or not recognize morality, but they don't make anything moral. And, and um, so that's a little bit confusing, but I would say that's how Americans are. If it's legal, it must be good. If it's illegal, it, it must be bad. And that's as far as they go in their thinking. You know, I, and I think that's true not, not just on life issues, but um, legalization of marijuana. Um, there was something else I was thinking of. But, but everything, you know, if it's legal, it's good and, and fine and moral. You know? We're just not deep thinkers. I don't, I don't believe on this issue, these issues. Anything else? All right, well, I'm gonna pray for us and turn this over to Earl. And I think he's uh, gonna be concluding our discussion tonight on this subject, depending on, th depending on how things go. But let's pray. Father, we're grateful for your word. We're grateful for our ability to have access to your thoughts and, and your statements in your word. And I pray that we would uh, not only hear, not only understand, but glorify you because of them uh, to, to love you because of them and to change and become more Christ-like because of them. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Girl.